Let's welcome in a global voice, Guy Steer, Head of Emerging Markets and Credit Research at Society General is joining us on the show now. Hi Guy, good afternoon to you from India. Let me start off with the global Hi. setup first. Uh, um, the focal point, I believe, for the investors globally is now the trade war issues between US as well as China. Um, do you see that impacting equities worldwide or do you expect some sort of negotiation to come by? Well, I think um, I think both of these are, I, I think I would say yes and yes to your question. I mean, I think it already has impacted equities worldwide and it will continue to do so uh, until there's a sense that um, we actually have uh, we actually have some uh, clear demonstrable deal on the table. I think the what, what, what has been very clear in the past week is that the discussions with China uh, are going to take longer than, uh, than Donald Trump had expected and as a result he has changed the focus or let's say he has made it very clear that the focus is on the relationship between the US and China and that any discussion about trade wars with Europe or any discussion about uh, the trade situation with Japan have been put on the back burner for six months. That doesn't mean that they're going away because trade has sort of been the thing which has defined Donald Trump's presidency more than anything else. But for the time being, I think what people are focused on globally and particularly in terms of emerging markets generally is what's going on between the relationship with uh, between the US and China. Hmm. Um, Guy, you track emerging markets pretty closely, so let me also get your view on India. I have one more to look at MSCI India. We've outperformed the MSCI Emerging Market as well as MSCI Asia X Japan Index. Uh, we now have a stable government for the next five years, but yet there are some macro headwinds. We'll be getting the GDP growth numbers this week for uh, the March quarter. And of course, there are some liquidity concerns here back home uh, for the economy. Do you see this outperformance of India continuing, or do you see some shift of allocation? now going ahead with regard to fund flows? Well, I think India relative to the rest of the emerging markets is, as you say, uh, still quite an attractive prospect because of the new government, because it's a government which is uh, perceived globally as being business friendly because, as your previous uh, guest was mentioning, there's some scope in terms of fiscal reflation and some good things that could be happening uh, in, terms of, uh, in, in terms of how the government could make the situation uh, attractive for equity investments or continue to make the situation attractive for equity investments. I think the bigger problem for a lot of investors now, however, is in the world where uh, emerging market currencies and the relationship between, and, and I suppose the dollar more broadly, has been very, very much driven by the CNY relationship. And the CNY has suddenly started to weaken, has suddenly started to get more volatile after a period of about uh, three or four months since the beginning of the year where it was extremely stable. Is this a world where people want to be pulling money out of emerging markets more generally? And this I think is a challenge for the Indian market because it has been a beneficiary of global capital flows because the situation has clearly been attractive. Uh, it's done well as a result. If there starts to be a vote more broadly against emerging markets, then I'm, I'm afraid because of people's positioning, India could be one of the, the countries which suffers from that, uh, from that move. Do your preferences be in the emerging market basket? Where does India stand currently? I, I'm sorry, I missed your question. Could you repeat it? What would your preference be in the emerging market basket when it comes to allocation of money and where does India stand currently? So particularly if I, if I were to look uh, globally in terms of uh, let's say currencies and rates, I think that um, possibly the, the, the part of the world which pays the, the best kind of returns in terms of the rate side is actually more Latin America at the moment uh, rather than the volatile markets of Europe or Asia. Asia's typically been one of the uh, lower beta parts of uh, emerging market basket. That's good in a world where things are a bit more challenged, uh, but it's uh, difficult in terms of being the part of the world which is most China-centric. So at this point, I think we would probably be more focused on Latin America and even CEMIA, the CEMIA region, uh, than we would on Asia just at the moment because of this challenge from China.
Guy, let's talk a little bit more about the volatility within global equity markets as well as for the Indian equity markets. Now that the election overhang is out of the way, the uh, India VIX has come off substantially. In fact, it has converged with the CBOE VIX, suggesting that any big move going forward will be trailed. Will be tr we will be trailing what happens to the global equity markets. In light of that, what are the big triggers for global equities? Well, I think there's a couple. I mean, I think we've already talked about trade, and I think trade probably remains, uh, at least for the next three to six months, the biggest focus. I think the second issue that the markets are grappling with is the global growth situation more broadly. And when I talk about global growth, I think there are three areas of concerns. The first is that some of the high frequency data in the US has been disappointing since the beginning of the year. So if you look at economic surprise indices, for example, in the US, they've been negative since the beginning of the year. U.S. profits are coming under a little bit of pressure, particularly in terms of U.S. profit margins. This is because the cost of labor is uh, beginning to increase. Now we're seeing fewer labor productivity gains. It's also because tariffs are something ha having some impact in terms of the, the margins in the U.S. U.S. companies have very poor pricing power because uh, a lot of power has shifted to the consumer relative to the producer over the last five to six years. That was something that the Fed talked about recently. But when you put that package together, it probably is a bit of a, a challenging situation for U.S. equities more broadly because of those margin constraints over the next six months. So that's one of the problems in terms of uh, growth and in terms of margins in particular. The second problem is Europe. We've just come through some European uh, elections, as you know, over the weekend. Uh, the extremist parties didn't do quite as well as some people uh, thought they might do, so we had more dominance in terms of the cre Greens. Uh, but Europe remains a block where there are a lot of challenges in terms of getting growth to improve too. We have our own growth challenges here in Europe. Uh, Europe is very uh, dependent on exports, particularly to uh, Asia and to China. If we start to see weak Chinese growth, that's a bit of a challenge for Europe as well. And then finally, the uh, Chinese situation, uh, Chinese high frequency data also has been a little bit disappointing recently. We've got the Chinese currency weakening at the moment. That may make it more expensive for the Chinese middle class to be buying goods, not only from Europe, but also from the US and from the rest of the world. So I think that beyond the, the trade focus by it in and of itself, we also have a broader concern about where is growth headed over the next six to 12 months. So I think that's going to dampen down equity markets. And as you say, in that context, India could be vulnerable to weakness elsewhere. Let's talk about some currencies then, and emerging market currencies. What happens now, that what, the kind of fluctuations we're seeing in the yuan, and what, what does it weigh out in terms of what happens to the dollar versus the rupee? So far, uh, it's been strength for the rupee versus the dollar, but is that likely to continue? Well, I think the, the, the big focus is really, as you mentioned, the uh, CNY, because if you look at the trading in global currencies since around 2016, um, we've seen that the CNY has tended to drive everything else. Even dollar crosses like dollar euro have been very sensitive to, to the CNY relationship. Now going forward, we've seen the increase in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, renminbi volatility. We've seen the uh, increase in terms of, uh, the, we've actually seen weakness in terms of the Chinese currency. Um, that could be in response to trade situations. That could be in response to the global growth situation. Uh, to the Chinese growth situation in terms of expectations of Chinese monetary policy easing. But even if in the very near term uh, the Chinese currency is a little bit oversold, and we could have a pullback and a, a bit of an appreciation in terms of the current Chinese currency, in the more medium term we probably are entering into a period of Chinese currency weakness that I think is going to drive the dollar higher against most emerging market currencies. All right, uh, Guy, we leave it at that. Thank you so very much for joining us this afternoon.